Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Chess Journal Club webinar. We are going to talk about diffuse alveolar hemorrhage after hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. I am Alice Gallo, and I'll be your moderator today. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Carroll. I am a uh, deputy editor of Web and Multimedia, and I will be assisting Dr. Gallo with questions today. My name is Jamie Zhang. I'm a first year pulmonary critical care fellow, and I'll be uh, one of the authors presenting. And my name is uh, Heimang Yadav. I'm one of the pulmonary intensivists at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, my research interests are predominantly in the field of ARDS and uh, respiratory failure in, in immunocompromised patients, uh, including after stem cell transplantation. Uh, and uh, I, I've been mentoring uh, Dr. Zhang uh, for the last uh, couple of years, including on this project, and I'm the senior author in this paper. My name is Misha Rossi. Um, I'm an intensivist at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Um, I am here as the content liaison. Um, my research interests uh, include diffuse alveolar hemorrhage post stem cell transplantation and uh, respiratory failure in uh, the HEMOC population. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you so much for being here today. And I just wanna tell our audience that all, all our panelists have no conflicts of interest to declare. So we are going to start right away, but I wanna remind the audience of two quick things. One, CME credit to claim will be ready in about a week after um, today's uh, live presentation. And please send questions, comments to our chat box and Dr. Carol will be um, reading them and um, we're gonna be answering to the questions live um, in a couple of minutes. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Dr. Um, Zhang, let me know if you need any of the, of the um, tables or figures for your paper. And the first question I would like you to answer for us is, what made you and Dr. Yadav um, look into DAH um, after stem cell, stem cell transplantation? Thank you, Dr. Yalo. So I think our thoughts for looking to this project is that um, in stem cell transplant recipients, pulmonary complications still carry a high mortality and morbidity risk. And um, having those complications is still not very well understood in the literature. Most of the information for DH after stem cell transplant are mostly published in the early 1990s or 2000s with patient population mostly coming from the 1980s to 1990s. Uh, but as we know that there has been a lot of advances both in kind of the uh, post-transplant survivorship and also our management for respiratory failure and ARDS and ICU cares in the last two decades. There's also a change in the transplant population. I think older patients have been getting stem cell transplants compared to previous years. With all those information, we wanted to just take a more up-to-date contemporary look into DAH in the uh, stem cell transplant population and get more information on the epidemiology, the risk factors, and the outcome. Dr. Yadav, anything to add? Yeah, you know, I think that um, the core for studying uh, this condition you know, stems from, you know, patient interactions, like most kind of research questions. And, and you know, we have a Hemonc ICU here and, you know, we have patients who come in uh, post stem cell transplant with DAH and, and the conventional teaching in our experience has been that the, you know, these patients do very badly. And uh, there's very little that we can kind of meaningfully offer to, to kind of um, alter that trajectory. And so, when we see these kind of patients uh, coming into the ICU, you know, we look at the literature to try and see, you know, what can we do for these folks? And, and, and really there's, there's very little in terms of um, kind of meaningful research out there beyond kind of pretty small case series and, uh, and pretty historic case series. And so that was kind of the main impetus for, for studying this in a kind of a more uh, defined manner uh, because we really don't understand, you know, what, DAH is in the setting. Um, it's certainly uh, a different uh, 
uh, syndrome than uh, DH after, for example, um, GPA or small vessel vasculitis. And it certainly, you know, probably doesn't lump in easily with the other post-transplant uh, pulmonary complications like IPS and, and PERD. So uh, it, it's probably a distinct entity, but just one that we have very little in the way of, of meaningful understanding about. And this uh, review is meant to be kind of the first step in, in trying to get uh, some degree of better understanding and to lay, a de- lay down a definition uh, to help study the condition uh, further in the future. Fantastic. Thank you. And... Um, I know I know one of your objectives for this paper was to standardize the definition for DAH. So um, Dr. Zhang, could you tell us a little bit more about this definition? What made you um, and your team decide to to do that? Yeah, um, sure, thanks. Uh, so I think we wanted to, you know, based on prior uh, data that sometimes if we just do a clinical, um, kind of diagnosis of DAH, sometimes patients probably, it's hard to know if they truly do have DAH. So we wanted to combine both clinical and radiographic and also uh, bronchoscopy data together to help us define those patients as having DAH. So Dr. Yaddo, if you don't mind going to figure one of the paper, um, for our uh, study, we used uh, definite and probable DAH as patients to include. So first they need to have acute respiratory failure defined with a new oxygen requirement. So hypoxia with, you know, sign of the clinical diagnosis. Then uh, based on chest imaging, either chest x-ray or CT scan to have bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. After they meet both those criteria, we look at patients who had bronchoscopy data. So if they had both what the traditional uh, DAH definition of progressively bloodier return on serial alloclause during VAL and having more than 20% of hemosiderin-laden macrophages um, on the pathology, then they will be meeting as definitive, uh, definite DH. But if they had only one criteria meeting in the bronchoscopy finding, then we said they are probable. Sometimes I think it's very hard to tell if it's progressively bloodier if it's bloody from the beginning. And I think that's also a description uh, by bronchoscopists. So we included that as a probable for that. And I think that the main uh, goal for for doing this uh, was twofold. One uh, is to try and give uh, clinicians uh, uh, who use this definition some kind of uh, guidelines or certainty for for diagnosing DH in the setting. Um, If you look at the um, post-stem cell transplant uh, respiratory failure syndromes, um, there's a lot of overlapping definitions and inconsistency with um, diagnostic criteria. And so trying to establish some kind of standardization would be helpful for that. And secondly, it kind of helps lays the, it helps uh, lay the groundwork for future research studies uh, in this field if we can have an accurate definition of, of what this is. Now, any definition uh, like this is probably going to be imperfect. Um, so if you look at each of the three criteria, you know, uh, is it possible that Uh, Someone who has uh, DAH after stem cell transplant uh, doesn't have an oxygen requirement. It's certainly possible, but it's probably unlikely. Um, You know, will they only have unilateral infiltrates rather than bilateral infiltrates? Um, Again, if they are having unilateral infiltrates, um, the underlying pathophysiology is unlikely to be diffuse. It's likely to be focal and and as such going to be either infectious or inflammatory rather than, than DAH. Uh, and uh, in terms of the bronch- bronchoscopic findings, um, that's probably the most controversial part of this definition, uh, since a proportion of patients, um, uh, both clinically and in prior research studies, have had DH defined uh, based on, um, uh, you know, without bronchoscopy confirmation. And the reason we really chose to have bronchoscopy confirmation was uh, that um, the uh, uh, only a minority of patients uh, in our cohort had hemoptysis clinically. So about uh, 15% or less uh, had uh, hemoptysis at presentation, uh, really making um, clinical criteria uh, you know, 
relatively misleading uh, about um, for diagnosing DH, both insensitive and, and uh, probably lacking specificity as well. Uh, so that was really the, the rationale behind the, the diagnostic criteria. Uh, and it also to give clarity for people just looking at our paper to see kind of what we used uh, in, in our um, uh, definition. Uh, Dr. Rathi, I'd be kind of interested to see what, what you think about this sort of definition, how that fits into your uh, practice, which is, you know, obviously sees a lot of uh, uh, this kind of patient population. Sure, happy to comment. And I just want to say, I am so happy that you all did this study because I think any one of us who takes care of, you know, post stem cell transplant patients in the ICU uh, knows that this is the dreaded complication with very poor outcomes. And I think that this is really important that as much information as possible, even if retrospective, is, is really important. Um, I think the diagnostic challenges are really tough um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, and I think it's important to have a diagnostic criteria for research. I completely agree. I think the toughest part is knowing what we know about the hemocytorin laden macrophage because I think that, you know, we know pathologically that it takes about 48 to 72 hours to, to actually have the macrophage digest enough heme to stain positive for hemocytorin. And so some of these patients, you know, in our experience, we've seen uh, have a normal test x-ray and 24 hours later have disease infiltrates. And so they end up intubated and brocked uh, right away. And so sometimes those bronchoscopies um, won't actually show, you know, the, the hemocytorin on that early bronch. Um, and so I think that's kind of why one of the reasons why it's important to know, you know, timing. Um, if you're doing an early bronch, it may be something that you might want to repeat if that's feasible. Um, the other issue, of course, is getting an adequate sample with enough macrophages, um, you know, even in there. And sometimes that's an issue, too. Um, and the other thing is that if you, you know, there have been some autopsy studies. I know you guys had autopsies, as did we on some of our studies. And um, our autopsies, like yours, were kind of far out from DH diagnosis. But there actually was a nice study done several years ago where they did, had an autopsy within seven days of uh, bronch. And I think they found that it was a flip of a coin, whether or not the BAL and the autopsy correlated. So some that showed alveolar hemorrhage in the autopsy had a negative bronch and vice versa. So it makes it all really, really tough for us who want to do research in this subject because where do we go in terms of um, making a definite criteria? I see more and more people actually leaning towards just a progressive, uh, you know, hemorrhagic return mm -hmm. on the on the BAL mm -hmm. a little bit more. And I think that's clinically probably reasonable. I think that, again, requiring a hemocytin later in macrophage, again, is, is just tough. No, I absolutely agree. And I think that, you know, that was part of the rationale behind using uh, this definite and probable um, kind of uh, criterion, at least giving you flexibility uh, to say, you know, if you have progressive hemorrhagic return, uh, but not hemocytin laden macrophages, you can at least still label that under the DH column, understanding that, uh, you know, the pathological confirmation uh, isn't there either because, like you said, in inadequate sample or uh, this was too early. Fantastic discussion. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Zhang, I'd like to go back to you and maybe you could share with us a few lines on your results. Um, mm -hmm. What 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 kind of results were more, most surprising um, to you? What kind of results were the ones you were expecting? Sounds good. Thanks, Dr. Gallo. So I think so. Kind of a general overview. We basically um, had about four thousand. Uh, 300 patients who underwent stem cell transplant in an 11-year period. So we uh, screened patients um, that we had data on from 2005 to 2016. And then we uh, look at those patients who does have bronchoscopy that was performed. And then so we identified 99 cases total of uh, probable and de definite DAH. So um, this table one is basically showing some of the uh, demographics and uh, information on those patients. So age around 53, um, we have, you know, 
probably equal split between males and females. It is a predominantly Caucasian population just because of our location in Minnesota and the patient population we are seeing here. Um, so DAH was more common in allogenic transplant patients. It was about 7.2%. And then, then autologous, which was about 1% of those patients, uh, which has been similar to what has been reported in previous literature. One thing that was a little bit surprising to us was that the median time to the DAH diagnosis was 126 days after their stem cell transplant, which is longer than previously reported because we typically see this uh, traditionally thought to be in the early post-transplant phase. Um, so that was a little bit surprising to us. The other is, you know, in terms of how sick these patients presented, when we look at our patient population, 51% of them did require invasive mechanical ventilation um, within you know, two days of diagnosis, or some of them were already on mechanical ventilation at the time of diagnosis. Um, the, we looked into hospital mortality for those patients. Basically, we defined it as patients who either uh, died during the hospital stay or they were discharged from the hospital on comfort cares or hospice. And we think, you know, overall, this is a hospital mortality. That was still pretty high at about 55.6%, which is... Um, about equivalent to previous reported studies, maybe a little bit lower than the studies from kind of the early 1990s. Um, one thing that was also looking at, you know, what are the significant risk factors uh, for these patients? So Dr. Gallo, if you can go to table four, when we did our um, multivariable regression analysis, looking at these, some of the significant findings that we found was first it was having DH 30 days after uh, stem cell transplant was associated with increased mortality, which is similar to what has been reported in previous literature. The other things that hasn't been reported in the past, but has been kind of wondered if they are associated are platelet counts at INR. So lower platelet count and higher INR was associated with worse mortality in hospital. Um, it's hard to say what significance of those are because, you know, the INR difference was 0 0.1, 0 0.2 between the survivors and the non-survivor group. Whether this is just reflecting an underlying coagulopathy or this is an indicator of disease severity or how sick those patients already are at baseline, um, it's hard to say. And I think, you know, this is probably hard to tease out if this is a causation or this is just what we're seeing, uh, reflecting those patients to be sicker and more likely to not survive their hospital stay already. Uh, the other is um, not very surprising, but for patients who did require invasive mechanical ventilation, they do have a higher hospital mortality. Uh, we did look more into, you know, kind of the treatments for uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. The there's not really a standardized treatment, but I think from um, experiences in patients with vasculitis and previous published uh, small trial data that steroid therapy is still kind of the mainstay for treating DAH in this population. When we look at it, it really didn't make any difference in terms of survivor, uh, in terms of hospital or ICU length of stay between patients. Thanks, Edmi. And, you know, I think uh, the things I just highlight here, um, you know, one, uh, that the overall mortality rate um, was about 55% uh, uh, in hospital. And uh, if you look at historic series, uh, they kind of report 80% or, or greater. Um, in general, I'm not a fan of comparing um, things to historical cohorts. It's a kind of, a, it's not a very meaningful comparison, uh, but it does appear uh, that mortality rate is a little bit lower than what was reported previously. Um, uh, second uh, is the point that Zenmay raised about uh, this being uh, kind of no longer a disease isolated to the early post-transplant period, uh, which is what still reported in uh, in textbooks and and on um, and kind of in the board board review question kind of um, uh, spectrum. And so this is, uh, you know, we really found this uh, did occur uh, at multiple points in the post-transplant period. Um, and that finding that um, patients who developed uh, 
late DAH did worse, that was independent of whether they had disease relapse or not. Uh, since that could be a potential confounder for why they did worse or not, but that was not a, um, a, um, a factor there. Um, and uh, the third thing I, I'd highlight uh, is that um, the um, question about steroids and the correlate or the comparison between this and um, you know, ankyvasculitis um, and other forms of capillaritis, um, you know, we uh, didn't find um, uh, any meaningful association between steroid therapy or steroid dose and survival or any other outcomes. Uh, and none of the patients who went to autopsy, albeit just a handful of patients, you know, many days after the DAH episode, uh, none of them had capillaritis on, on autopsy. And so, um, you know, the uh, one possibility is that, uh, you know, the different lung injury syndromes that we see after transplant, uh, ARDS, perigraphment respiratory distress syndrome, uh, idiopathic pneumonia, and diffuse alveolar hemorrhage are all kind of spectrums of a disease process, um, and they may have shared kind of pathophysiologic underpinnings, um, but we don't... Um, uh, fully kind of understand what makes one patient present with one versus the other. And so I think uh, the only way to kind of look at that meaningfully is going to be prospectively with uh, kind of mechanistic um, studies. Uh, again, Dr. Rathley, I'm not sure um, how you felt the um, kind of findings here uh, uh, compared to both historic reports of DAH and also uh, with your experience of DAH in this population. Yeah, uh, you know, I think one of the most unique, uh, I guess, aspects of your study is that 40% of your patients actually did not receive steroids. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's really valuable information because, um, you know, as you know, having reviewed the literature yourselves, uh, steroid dosing is all over the place. So we at our institution years ago were giving the, you know, sometimes the gram a day or the 125 Q6 dosing of methylprednisolone. Um, our findings, um, we did not have that many patients who were not on steroids like yours. So we pretty much evaluated only steroids and found that similarly, you know, the, the higher dose steroids had worse outcomes. So as we changed our practice, um, we now limit that to two milligrams per kilogram of methylpred um, per day. But your study really brings up an even more important question. You know, are steroids doing anything, especially in these patients who, uh, who we're finding that have late transplant complications? You know, you, you think, you would think that the early transplant period, maybe in the first 30 days, they're more steroid responsive. But, um, you know, and I was actually curious to know if you guys had looked at in your less than 30 day population, if there were a greater proportion of auto versus allo patients in there. Um, so that's one question I have for you. But um, I think that this brings up the point that we need to reevaluate whether or not we're doing more harm, um, because I think that there are many people out there who are still treating with these really high dose steroids. We know that that can obviously have its own set of complications. And then even in your study, um, I think you had quite a few patients who had positive cultures and many of them positive for fungal, mm -hmm. um, fungal elements. And so that's, mm -hmm. again, scary when you're giving high dose steroids to someone with uh, potential fungal pneumonia. So just, you know, excited to hear your thoughts on what you think about all that. Thanks, Dr. Rossi. And I think we also look at, you know, for patients who, whether it presented within 30 days and after 30 days of transplant, and we, you know, did a, some like subgroup analysis for those, whether they received steroids or not, and it still didn't make any difference. Um, but granted, our numbers were pretty small because we were looking at, you know, 59 patients total. And when we divided by within 30 days and after 30 days, those numbers did get a lot smaller. So it's hard to kind of inter uh, interpret from that what the significance of it is. Um, in terms of how many were more auto in the within 30 days group and uh, allo, I don't remember that off the top of my head, but Dr. Gallo, would you mind going to figure two? Because I think when we do look at the, yeah, kind of the number of patients uh, having total DAH cases. So I think, you know, the autologous groups and the allogenic groups, it's hard to say if any one of them had more within 30 days compared to others. 
I don't know if Dr. Yadav had more things to add. No, I mean, I, I, I just don't think we have the case numbers to answer yeah. those questions with any granularity. Um, you know, I think um, we, and, and we did look at whether um, infection and steroid therapy were um, kind of interrelated. And, and there was, again, within the small numbers we had, we didn't uh, see a relationship there. But like you mentioned, giving high dose steroids to the population, um, you know, who might have uh, fungal disease or invasive fungal infection is uh, certainly problematic. Um, I think, you know, going forward, um, if you see these patients uh, kind of at the bedside, uh, and you're kind of making the decision whether to give steroids or not. Um, you know, I think this study on its own is probably insufficient to say don't give steroids. I, I don't think we can kind of reach that conclusion from the data we have. Um, you know, and it's also very difficult when faced with these situations to do nothing. Uh, you know, as something uh, I think we've found uh, again and again uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's always a temptation to do something. And so... Uh, you know, I think that it's very reasonable to study steroids versus no steroids in a trial setting. Um, but, uh, you know, on this data, I think it's, you know, we can't say don't give steroids in this setting. Um, I think all we have, all we can say is that, you know, maybe there's a suggestion of, of either lack of benefit or harm in, in, in steroid therapy. And, and again, Dr. Dov, just, just to add to that thought, um, cause it's very important, um, to kind of like correlate what Dr. Uh, Rafi just said, and it might be the mechanism of DAH in this patient population in comparison to our vasculitis, like you were mentioning before, mm-hmm. most likely the vasculitis one is more inflammatory and this one is more capillary leak. If, if we think about the physiology behind it, would that be right. fair to say that that probably also why maybe these patients don't respond as much to steroids as we would like them to? Yeah, no, I, th- I think uh, it probably comes back to the, um, you know, the fact that the post-transplant lung injury syndrome infectious, um, there's going to be an endotype there that responds to steroids and endotype um, using alveolar hemorrhage as a marker of the endotype that responds may just not be the way to, to look at it. I think the, you know, there, must, there has probably a better way to enrich that patient population to see who would benefit, benefit from steroids and, and who would. And just to add to that, um, I think, <clears throat> you know, when we look at the path, the limited path that we do on autopsy on these patients, a lot of it is, is diffuse alveolar damage, you know, rather than actual capillaritis or, or even pulmonary hemorrhage and, you know, the, the, physio- the pathologic correlate to ARDS. And so it makes you wonder, should we just be doing ARDS dosing? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I think that the fact that you showed that the less than 30 day patients actually did better is suggestive, you know, that could there be more in, you know, inflammation in that immediate post-transplant period. Yeah. And which was one of the reasons I was wondering you know, if you do about the allo versus auto, since, you know, totally different mechanisms mm-hmm. in terms of lung injury sure. immediately mm-hmm. post-transplant. Absolutely. Excellent discussion. I'm loving it. And another question for Dr. Yadav and Dr. Zhang. So what, how, after getting your results and everything, how would you manage these patients moving forward? I think... Um, I think standard, you know, good critical care, supportive care is still the most important thing. From the information that we gathered, I think trying to correcting for underlying coagulopathy might be something that would be helpful. Um, I think these patients still, you know, when in this cohort, they still received platelets or received reversal of their coagulopathy if needed. Um, We even look at, you know, their number 72 hours prior, but it didn't seem like that made any difference. Um, But it's unclear at this time if there is, you know, the underlying coagulopathy contributing uh, to their diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So correcting those would be important. And based on this, I think cautious with steroid therapy. I don't think like Dr. Yadav mentioned that we can use this data to say we're not gonna give steroids uh, in these patients. But 
you know, there's information that, you know, and Dr. Rothi mentioned, potentially higher dose of steroids are associated with worse outcomes compared to lower dose. And our cutoff, we look at it was 250 uh, per day, which is still a decent dose of methylpred in this patient. So instead of doing one gram, I think there's probably more consideration of doing a lower dose of steroid rather than the typical dosing in vasculitis patients. So I think those are what I'm gathering from the study. And I think we definitely need more information, likely uh, most beneficially from a prospective trial to study this and to have better understanding of the pathophysiology and the future management of this patient population. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Zeng. You know, I, I agree. I think I would manage these patients as if they have uh, ARDS, essentially. Um, and in terms of specific therapies, um, you know, I'd, I'd probably be relatively generous with transfusion support um, and to make sure they don't have coagulopathy. Um, I think that the steroid uh, therapy uh, is always going to be a shared decision between patient, um, the hematology team, and, and uh, the intensive care team. Um, but I would feel relatively comfortable dragging my feet a little bit on the steroid therapy uh, making sure that we don't have infectious kind of um, elements and uh, seeing at BAL before we kind of pull the trigger on steroids and, and using limited uh, dose steroids in that setting. And I personally, I, I'll, I'll also be comfortable kind of doing um, kind of the ARDS dexamethasone uh, dosing uh, as well. Dr. Rathi, anything that you would add? To the management? Yeah, I no, I think the other, you know, you mentioned the coagulopathy. Of course, that's the big question that everyone has. Do we transfuse platelets? I mean, you know, which again is not without its own set of complications and then, you know, blood shortages all the time. And so um, that is something we struggle with at our institution as well. At what point do you transfuse? Because you're, you're essentially transfusing on a daily basis in many of these patients and what threshold? You know, is it 40? Is it 50? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our, our experience, our, our mean platelet count was in the 40,000 range, uh, which isn't terrible. <laughs> um, and then there are patients with platelets mm -hmm. in the single digits that do not have alveolar hemorrhage. So I think that it's really tough um, to say that we should definitely transfuse uh, because I, I think that, you know, it's a, it's a scarce resource that we have to think about. Um, I think that is something for a prospective trial, which would be somewhat complicated, but I think doable and important. Thank you so much. Dr. Adav, I wanted to go back to something that you said early, because I loved, I loved that you said, um, what you said earlier, I wanted to make sure that we had something meaningful to offer, um, to this patient. So, I wanted to make sure that um, to give you another opportunity to comment uh, with, with this work you started um, to look into meaningful management for these patients with EAH. So what's next? Yeah, so I think that the, for me, um, you know, it comes down to finding uh, the um, uh, kind of the subtype or endotype of uh, post uh, uh, transplant lung injury patient that is going to be responsive to a therapy. And I think that uh, certainly uh, steroids are probably the easiest first thing to study um, based on experience, both in the um, ARDS and COVID setting, but also in uh, the post stem cell transplant patient. Um, and the only way to really um, understand um you know, the endotype more meaningfully would be uh, to try and identify who's going to be at greater risk of developing uh, these lung injury syndromes, including uh, DEH, and doing some kind of mechanistic work to try and see what is the pathophysiologic process uh, that occurs. And so um, I think that uh, for me, that would be the next step. Uh, and then, uh, you know, essentially uh, um, applying uh, a more kind of precise um, 
uh, dosing strategy than kind of indiscriminately giving um, a therapy, be it steroids or, or whatever else. There's a there's a good question in the chat about um, the place of immunotherapy, and I wonder if uh, you had some comments on that. Uh, so, um, I, if by immunotherapy do you mean the role of things like uh, etanercept and and other kind of monoclonals, or um, or it was a question a bit more uh, specific? It didn't specifically the- say, so I will let you. Judge. Sounds good. Yeah, no, I think that um, the question of uh, whether um, to use uh, certain um, uh, monoclonals in the setting uh, is pretty controversial. Um, it's uh, linked to uh, case series and case studies. Um, I think that uh, we use it occasionally um, in kind of cases of last resort, uh, where almost invariably it is ineffective. Um uh, because really, by that point, we're so far down the the, the pathway of um, you know lung injury, respiratory failure, everything that goes with that, including kind of critical illness, uh, weakness, and complications. Uh, that um, giving a monoclonal antibody, we you know you know doesn't do much or or anything. Um, and uh, I I personally. Um, wouldn't really use those therapies in the setting. Um, you know, the post-transplant period is uh, in terms of uh, the immune uh, reconstitution and infection risk, and kind of adding an, a new agent into that uh, is complicated. Uh, it's uh, something that, um, you know, again, there's always often a desire to do something, um, but, um you know, I, I don't think and uh, giving monoclonals off label is necessarily the answer here. Um, again, we have done it in our practice, uh, especially in IPS and etanercept, but um, I, I, I just probably wouldn't uh, do it routinely. I'm not and sure. I realize it's outside the scope of the paper as well, too. But uh, I, I do have a question related to your paper. Um, so the def- back to the definitions, if you go to figure one for a second, uh, Dr. Gallo, um, the uh, bilateral pulmonary infiltrates are the requirement to have um, to be diagnosed with this, similar to the ARDS, the adult ARDS criteria where you need bilateral infiltrates too. I know that the pediatricians in defining pediatric ARDS and kids are different than adults, but uh, eliminated the bilateral based on evidence that clinicians and even radiologists are not great at, uh, at concordance between unilateral and bilateral definitions. So I wonder if, um, if you collected data about how many of these patients had one sided infiltrates and, you know, whether that's a population that's worth looking at. We look at. Maybe you want to. Yeah, um, I think when we look at this, we had about. um, I'm trying to. I mean, make sure I'm saying the correct thing. I think we had about more more than half the patients who had CT scans, and then majority of those were bilateral um, ground glass opacities. But I don't think. Let's see. Yeah. So, fifty-one percent were ground glass, but. I think I didn't say specifically whether it was unilateral or bilateral. Unfortunately, I imagine they were all bilateral because that was your definition. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. they were all bilateral. And I think the partially the question, uh, the, we look at those patients and then kind of screen down to those who had bronchoscopy findings. So I don't think we expanded the cohort and look at other patients who had unilateral. Right. Um, I'm just wondering for a future investigation whether that yeah. might be interesting. It's a good mm-hmm. question. Dr. Rathian, I have one more question for you. In your opinion, again, uh, again as, as our um, content lies on, what do you think is the next step for, for this pathology, for DAH, and, 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 and like Dr. Yadav pointed out, um, all the post-transplant lung syndromes, what's, what's the future? Yes, I, I mean, we definitely need to try to get some prospective um, you know, ideally randomized trials to really tease out what is the appropriate therapy, whether steroids are doing more harm or are they having some benefit. Um, 
in order to do that appropriately, though, we need someone brave enough to not give steroids. And as Dr. Yadav mentioned, you know, that's a tough thing to do because everybody wants to do something. And it's hard to sit back and watch a patient in respiratory failure, you know, doing poorly and not do anything. Um, and I think also because of, as we talked about ARDS, you know, you know, steroids may have some benefit early on. So, um, you know, it's possible that we need to sort of look at which doses um, are appropriate. Um, I think there's also some value in looking at volume status because I know in our experience too, we had, um, you know, not that we had echoes on everybody, but we had a lot of, you know, elevated BNPs and things like that. And, and I think that um, that in itself, you know, uh, pulmonary congestion can cause DAH, um, bland DAH. And so that's something important. Um, other novel therapies, a Tanercept, there, there was a trial, a randomized trial. They did have to stop it early, though, because um, I don't think they had enough uh, patients for the study. So it was underpowered at that point. Um, but, you know, there is some pasto physiologic basis for that. I think there are elevated TNF alpha levels, you know, found in, in lung models, humans, and animals. Um, so it could be something worth trying, but, in, you know, we'd have to get enough numbers. So it'd probably have to be something multi-centered um, to do that. And then, you know, other things I know our institution has tried, um, you know, antifibrinolytics. So uh, aminocoproic acid and people have tried, you know, factor factor seven and things like that. Um, those are not without those complications. We didn't see any benefit from those retrospectively. Um, so we kind of don't, you know, we don't use that a lot anymore, but um, you know, there's different ways of giving that. So I think that's something that we need to look at as well in the future. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I want to thank all the panelists for joining us this afternoon. This was a fabulous discussion for someone who loves taking care of um, critically ill patients with, with cancer. I loved being with you for this past 45 minutes. And um, I would like to thank you so much. And I want to make sure that before we say um, goodbye, Chris, any other questions from the audience? No, I think that was I think that was it. I want to thank people as well for listening and for attending this. Yeah. I want to thank all, all the people who joined us this afternoon. And um, the CME credits are going to be available in a week from now. And the recording of this webinar is also going to be available in a week from now for those of you who join a little late. And again, I want to thank Dr. Zing, Dr. Yadav, and Dr. Rathi for joining us this afternoon on behalf of the Chess Journal. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you Bye so much. It's a pleasure.